Okay, just quick, have we, are we starting or can we chat on? Um, I've hit the go live button. It's going to be on the test panel. Yep. Uh, sorry, on the title panel. Um, I'm just going to... All right, where uh, the title scene is now live. <laughs> Starting at 6 p.m., it's now a quarter past. But we got there in the end. Yeah. Okay. It's only 11 past, don't exaggerate. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, there we go. Uh, All right. Um, I'm just going to bring the stream up and and uh, see if we've got anyone tuning in. We've got two viewers already. Great. I'm sharing it up to Fab now. That should help. Um, no, it's not letting me share it. Oh, it's because I'm as Fab. I see. I can share it on my personal. You see the you see the stream? Yep. Great. Um, share to newsfeed. And then this uh, like five or six times before and it's still fucking up. You wait till they start actively editing <laughs> access to internet. Okay. You also muted now. Why did you mute? I don't know, I'm back. Okay. One of my biggest fears was always like the internet turning into an intranet. Like, you know, nationalizing it in a sense, and it's like, this is all you get, similar to what China does. It's like, fuck, that would be like literally the worst thing I could ever imagine. Hmm. Uh. Alright, I'm going to switch over to. Um, you also, can you just c confirm the, the music's playing okay? Um. I need to just open it up again. I'm sharing it up to Fab now. It's like I can't hear music on my end through the stream. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm guessing you're meaning like Facebook. Yep. Um, okay. One second. I'm sharing it up to Facebook. It's like I can't Music. Oh. music. Okay, there should be music playing. Yep. Music. Music's playing, but I guess there's no audio there. Uh, whatever. I'll switch over to the other scene. Alright. We're now, video is now live for the conference, and hopefully in a few minutes people will start hearing audio. We've got a few people tuning in online. A few people watching the stream. Hopefully everyone should be able to hear it okay. I can see myself, excellent. Can I hear myself? Can be seen, but not heard. children like children, are all right, cool. We are going. Excellent. Yossip, can you hear yourself? Um, I was able to. There's a bit of a hum. That's the only problem I've got. I can hear like an audible ringingness. Okay. So that's the only. Cool. We are going. Well, at least we've got audio now. Yossip, can you hear yourself? Okay. Well, uh, yes, anyway, um, we're, we're here, people are watching, uh, so they must they must be interested in something that's going on. <laughs> so I'll, I'll quickly introduce myself um, now that we're live, and anyone who's on, please, please do feel free to chime in with comments, questions, so on and so forth. Um, this is the Pirate Live stream number two with Yosef and Miles. You can um, 
you can find stream number one on my other page, my personal page. Uh, but for you tuning in for the first time, this is a this is a, a continuation of the stream that I started during the state elections last year. So uh, with me, I have some special guests. Uh, obviously, Yosef Zidum is the one. Uh, those of you might recognise him from my stream last year, and also Dr. Andrew Catalaris. I'll, um, I'll get you guys to introduce yourselves before I talk about myself first. So, Yosef, why don't you take it away? Um, I'm just letting you know that it's really bad noise, like digital noise. It's like piercing the ears. Um, so just have a look. The volume's a bit low, so just stuff that. But I'll introduce myself. Um, my name's Yosef, I am the founder of Strangy Ozzy Buzz. Um, we're a cannabis publication in Australia. Basically, we like to talk about the culture um, surrounding cannabis, and we try and help with a little bit of the destigmatization of it. Um, recently, I ran for the state election for the Legalized Cannabis Queensland Party um, for the seat of Miller. Um, other than that, I run a digital marketing company, so full service digital agency. Um, that's what I do in my every waking minute, more or less, um, other than smoke pot and go to gigs and play guitar. So that's basically who I am. Um, and I'll take it to Andrew, I guess. Introduction? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Andrew Catalaris. Uh, um, I've been a medical doctor, I was a registered medical doctor for 30 years. But uh, my more important work, I think, started in 1988 when we started the uh, legalised hemp movement. Um, we actually yeah. pursued a number of strategies and actually had growing licences at the end of uh, last century. And that we actually had medical growing licences as well, even though there was a political backlash. So a lot of what we did earlier paved the way for some of the success we're having now. Um, I've also run a medical necessity defence in the district court before a jury. And uh, I consider that's been a very useful uh, action for the movement because it has stayed the hand of the police uh, from interfering in a lot of compassionate growing and things like that. Um, my current interests are really developing hempcrete, magnesium hempcrete, as a perfect building material for Australian conditions and running as the um, Hemp Party Senate candidate in the next federal election making a serious attempt and trying to get a voice of reason and sanity into the uh, dark recesses of the Canberra political environment. Great. So um, hopefully the couple of people said there's a little bit of a hum on stream. Hopefully that will uh, resolve shortly. It's so, a little less now. Excellent. Yeah, I've been playing with the, the levels a little bit. So... Uh, now, now that we've sort of introduced yourselves, um, my name's my name's Miles. For those of you who don't know me, I'm um, the national president of Pirate Party Australia, former Senate candidate for Pirate Party Australia in the federal election 2019, and um, bit bit of a, a figure out about town up here in in Brisbane. Now, um, the so, so as I said in the intro. Um, this is a, a continuation, a part two of the, the stream I had with Yossip. Uh, the state election earlier this year. So um, uh, we had so much fun that, that we decided to to keep it going. Now, um, some of the some of the contents we talked about included the um, Yossip your policies on the election during the election, as well as. Um, a, a, as well as a, a general impression of the other parties that were running and various other updates as well. So now that we're out of the election season and we're into more of a, 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 a between election cycle, as it were, things are a little bit calmer and we can we can have a little bit of fun and, and just sort of explore and, and see where our conversations go. Some of the, um, the those of you who want a quick recap of our stream during the state election, some of the stuff we talked about included um, the uh, uh, hemp agriculture in Queensland as well as um, recent developments in the legalization status of cannabis in Australia and around the world, the use of medical cannabis, as well as various other uh, positions which Yossip has taken to 
an election now and other parties have as well. So uh, I asked you at the end of the stream, or actually at the start of the last stream, Yossip, I asked you, well, how did you go in the election and where do you see yourself going next? So now, now we're a few months along. How have you been recovering from the, the post-election stress? Um, I entered a whole bunch more stress with my actual day job, which is my own business. Um, so I went from that straight into a lot of client work that um, I kind of put on hold while I was in the election. So I've been flat out and honestly I can't wait for the next week to end and I can take an actual break. Haven't had a break really all year. I've been working probably harder this year than I ever have. Um, and election-wise, we went all right. Um, we pretty much did better than Quiet Palmer's party. Um, and he spent probably, I think it was like $6 million in ads and all of the rest. So it's like, we didn't really have any money. There was nothing. And so it's like, you can really see people coming through going, yeah, we kind of want cannabis. Um, I think that's becoming very apparent. I got about 3% of the votes um, for what was done. That was pretty impressive. I beat out One Nation and Clive Palmer in my electorate. A few other electorates had a few um, people that had about 6 to 8 9% of the vote. Um, I think Bundaberg was one of the biggest um, uh, turnouts for the Legalized Cannabis Party. So that was good, and then since then we've seen actually like huge things going on with cannabis, and like cannabis is obviously something that I'm very passionate about, and um, we've seen the UN uh, reclassifying cannabis. Um, we saw Victoria putting in a bill to try and change the law surrounding um, medical cannabis patients being drug tested while driving and trying to make it that they actually have permission to have a little bit of a higher level within their blood system and things like that. And then you also had in the US, um, the House vote to decriminalize cannabis. So like in terms of cannabis, 2020 is wrapped up really nicely um, for a few big step forward, uh, steps forward. So. I don't know, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing where cannabis goes and where the party ends up in you know, three, four years. Who knows? Um, we might actually have cannabis representation in government. <laughs> yeah, with a, with a bit of luck, we can, we can definitely hope. So, Andrew, you're, you're quite active with the Hemp Party, I believe. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your history with hemp and, and how they went in the recent federal election last year? Well, during my lifetime from 1988, I've devoted a lot of time, personal money and effort generally into progressing him. And the reason I've done that is I really think it is the single most effective and applicable solution to all our problems. Like as a broad overreach of the way I see the world's problems, we went from a carbohydrate-based world that grew things to a hydrocarbon-based world that extracted things, we have to go back to a carbohydrate world. Industrial agriculture using hemp and other fast-growing cellulose plants, KNAF, Ramey, Jute, there's a whole lot, but especially hemp for a number of reasons which we'll go into because it's much more than a fibre plant. Yep. But just at the fibre level, it's already a game changer. Right? When we do the sort of arithmetic, for instance, in how much carbon we can sequestrate and this isn't some pipe dream that they talk about carbon sequestration at coal burning power stations. Mm. We're talking about real calculations for sequestration into building long term building materials. Yeah. Right? It's a massive advantage using hempcrete. Hempcrete is fireproof and termite proof, is better thermal and acoustic insulation than any of its competitors and cheaper. Right? So that, and it breathes. Hey? And it breathes. Yeah, oh, it's beautiful. That's, we, built that's hemp, so impressive. we built a hempcrete cabana in Sydney, and it was just a pleasure to be in. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, we experienced real magic as well. We had a, a rainbow land in our hempcrete cabana and just light it up. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> but yeah, that, look back, back to it. Listen, almost every problem we've got can be improved or totally remediated by the use of large-scale industrial hemp. Right. Firstly, microplastics and people really. Let's, um, this, this is really exciting. We'll, we'll get into this in a moment, but let's um, let's just draw back quickly to to the election last year. So uh, you're you're in you're in Sydney, I believe. How well, no, the it was the Senate? Was Senate? We only ran a Senate candidate. 
but it was a very similar yeah. result to Yossi. That about three percent, we are two point seven percent of the vote, and you know, on a par with Clive Palmer. But he showed out sixty million dollars during the federal election. We got the same with nothing. We we enrolled three days before the close. What we want to do this time is make a much more serious effort. I mean, over the last 20 years, we've been treating politics really as something we should get onto or we should do more of or something like that. The world is careering into a dystopia. And if we don't take effective action now, uh, we'll lose our future, mm. right? I mean, we can have a transition to a green world, right? Everything that's made from petrochemicals can be made from hemp or other forms of cellulose. Hemp plastic. I'll just finish this. Henry Ford built a hemp plastic car in 1941. You've all seen Billion Dollar Crop, I expect. Yep. I hope all the listeners have. The Billion Dollar Crop, it's on YouTube. It's a documentary we made in 1995, which propelled um, the state government because of the responses we got to actually start the hemp growing process using a 23-4B loophole that we found in the Drugs Act. <laughs> Listen, I've been active for seven years trying to get a license. Just let me say this. Seven years trying to grow, to get a license to grow hemp. Blocked at every turn. I finally read the Drug Act from cover to cover and found this thing called 23-4B, which allows the cultivation of an otherwise prohibited plant for scientific research or analysis. And that was the sort of the chink in the armour that got the hemp growing. So, yeah, there's lots of ways, but we have to make a big effort. I mean, people are asleep mm. at the wheel while the car mm. is running in very dangerous directions. That's the way I see it. Like right? the health of the population is in a down, a death spiral. Yeah, right? for sure. I mean, well, I, I, well, we're all, well, like we're all, we're all hundred percent on board with the idea of looking at new technologies and uh, new materials, new resources, because we absolutely do have to address this existing. They're not uh, new. They're not new. Uh, These are old ones. Exactly. Exactly. But that, we, we haven't put them into use. So. Um, so, so taking these policies all in, into the election, what um, do you, it, given you you got about I think you said th three to three three percent for your Senate candidate two point seven two point seven that's a pretty good result um, and it's it sort of approximately mirrors uh, what Yossips was. So, do you do, do you see this result continue for him continuing into the future at a federal level, or are you um, oh, obviously no, aiming to steadily build it? No, no, yeah, no, not no. We don't have time to steadily do anything. Right? I mean, I consider, and I, I don't know how many other people share this, but they should, I consider what's happening around the world, as well as in this country, a disaster. Right? When you look at what the potential future is, say, for the generation under us, you know, almost nil prospect of owning a home, little prospect of having quality employment, you know, regularly through their life, there's all sorts of trials and tribulations before we even get onto the geopolitical thing, like the sort of fanatics that control the nuclear weapons and the mm. nuclear meltdown going on at Fukushima, right? There's a host of problems and we're really asleep at the wheel. What we have to do, we need 15% to get a senator in the, in the parliament, mm. right? If we get 3%, we just need one of those voters to become five voters and we've got the microphone that we need. We've got the privileged voice in the parliament. It may be ignored, it may be hard to change rules, mm. but once we've got that another chin in the arm or another 23-4B, uh, I mean, I'd like to think it might be me at the microphone telling the truth, right? Someone who's articulate at the science, who can critique the pseudoscience that's being put around over this COVID virus and translate the bullshit into it sort of, you know, understandable terms. Yeah, well, we, we, we definitely want to do that. And okay. let, let's look at some of the let, let's look at some of the uh, media problems right in front of us. Then, so three uh, percent is is a fairly solid result, but it's a little bit shy of fifteen percent. It's it's exactly one fifth of fifteen percent. So, so so digging into that a little bit deeper, we've got uh, we've got this this crazy thing going on here. There's there's a the hemp party helping marijuana prohibition, prohibition. We've also got the LCQ party, the legalized cannabis party. And, and, and they're separate parties. And, and I said this to Yossip when it came up, and he said, oh, I'm running for the LCQ party. And my first thought was, oh, uh, I'm, running for, yeah, I'm running for the cannabis party. My first thought was, oh, he's running for him. But no, it turns out he's running for a different party. So what, what's, what's the story there, Yossip? Do you want to take that one? Uh, I mean, I can. I can't really comment too much. I wasn't too involved in the setup of the party and all of that. Um, mm. From what I understand, it's, it's the 
um, Deb and Gail just wanted to get on top of it. They really wanted to run kind of their show with it. They have a massive following. They have, um, you know, their community, and they also are connected to a few other communities that really help boost them along. Um, why it wasn't done under the hemp banner, I'm not really sure. Like, I can't really comment on what's happened. I just know that, like, really important that you asked, that yeah, I mean, as well. What it was, it was an initiative by a couple of the individuals, committed individuals, and it was done at the state level. There's no other hemp part. There wasn't two parties running pushing the hemp party. Yeah, it's not a big issue there. Um, we had a meeting with the hemp party and LCQ uh, a couple of weeks ago at Nimbin. Yep. And, you know, the relations are excellent and they'll work together in, at the federal level. There was discussion yeah. as to which name should be taken on board, but we've decided to stay with the hemp name because we want to use that acronym, not for help in marijuana prohibition, but to stand for the key policies of health, environment and employment, right, manufacturing and progress, basically. Right, The yep. key psychological and philosophical issue the hemp party is promulgating is that you can have full employment or quality employment and the environment, right? Yep. You don't have to chop down the trees and have 10 people working on the chainsaws. You can have 10,000 people working in big downstream industries, right? So the, the zero sum game that these turkeys push, if you don't chop down the trees, you won't have any, any jobs, right? Yep. We can resolve that and we can resolve it very positively. We can return large scale primary wealth to the farmers with upstream manufacturing, quality jobs, industry development, right? In terms of policy, well, right, that, within that, a period of time, we would mandate that all packaging had to be completely non-toxic. Andrew, and if I can jump in here, you, you, you just covered about, I think, uh, you also, I've got the count right, probably about six or seven different topics there. And, and there's some really great stuff in there, but we want to sort of slow down a bit and let's, let's try and explore one topic at a time. So what, um, Let's so starting with you, Yosef. You, you've obviously got a real focus area. Both of you have a real focus area on on cannabis legalization and and various other related topics to that. But what was your your favorite, your personal favorite aspect of the whole cannabis legalization debate? Uh, it wasn't a debate, mate. There, yeah. was, uh, there was us braying, braying in the world. I wish there was a Look. debate. Listen, if we could get them to debate, there'd be no problem because they're foolish to put on display. Andrew's I remember like a whole it's meant to right there. Hey, um, yeah. It's, it's, it's so frustrating because when you sit outside oh, and listen to politicians talk about cannabis, or actually anyone even remotely, I don't know, it's just bizarre, these people don't have a fucking clue. Yeah. And this is the problem. It's, it's like... They pretend they understand something they don't, and fundamentally, we as people who have invested our time and love and passion into this, we're seeing these people go, oh, it's actually still a gateway drug, oh, it causes psychosis, oh, like, just any excuse, and that's treated as, like, fact, they can get it disputed, doesn't matter. Debunk myths. Doesn't matter. Yeah, because the media just keeps, if you repeat a lie enough, it supposedly it becomes, becomes true. the truth. But not in my world, it doesn't. You can say a lie a million times, the truth remains the truth. See, I think what's so frustrating is a lot of the time when I see, you know, politicians talking about the topic of cannabis, and say you talk about that psychosis element. Yes, cannabis can definitely cause psychosis to someone who has a predisposition. It's something that can happen, but they can also have that trigger through drinking. They could have hey, it from wait, a, wait a traumatic minute, event. Hey, hey Yossip, listen to this, mate. I've got a contrary view. I, I am absolutely convinced cannabis does cause psychosis. And in a large number of people, you just have to mention the word cannabis to a politician and they go psychotic. <laughs> <laughs> There's no doubt about it. I've seen it in yeah. the last 30 years. So when we were talking about like what my favorite policy is, like, I mean, the only one that matters to me is just full cannabis legalization, right? Probably the thing I care for most with it, I really, really hope we don't go down the route where people at home can't grow their own. I think it's really, really, really important that people have that as a choice. Um, and the rest of it, I don't care. Just allow people to have a few plants at home um, to produce their own cannabis, whether it, some people want to fucking just juice it. You know, Listen, our, our formal <laughs> policy on that, now we've got a formal policy, what we call a three tier supply. Mm -hmm. And the first and the essential tier of supply is homegrown. 
Yes. Right? And when you say a couple of plants, I mean not some measly sum, something like 20 plants to include 10 flowering females, something yep. like that to provide an yep. annual supply. Listen, I'm not even mad if it's six plants flowering, you know, like... Yeah, that sort of thing, but no, not, this, not this one or two plants which is meaningless, yes. right? That's the, the first tier of the supply chain. The next tier is a compassionate. People like the embassy and, uh, and a whole lot of other groups that are already producing quality cannabis extracts for and, and supporting patients in their thousands now. And the third tier is pharmaceutical cannabis. Now, in my experience, pharmaceutical cannabis has less therapeutic efficiency and efficacy than artisanal, carefully grown and extracted cannabis. Man, I, I tell you, Andrew, I've got right. medicinal. I've got it now. It's fucking excellent pet medicine. Absolutely good. What, what is it though? Which one? There's lots I've of got the ANTG Solace. Which I, one? the Solace. S O L A C E. Is it bud? Yeah, yeah. Bud, bud. yeah. Oh, yeah. I've, I've had some uh, Tilray bud. It was really good. Unbelievable. Like, I, because I knew the quality a few years ago was trash and it was expensive. Yeah. Now, price has come down to the point where it's getting close yeah, to street level. Look, we're not talking about you. Quality is bad. Hang on. We're not talking about you. We're talking about thousands of people. Yes. that rely, they're not going to be using that, they're going to be using different extracts, okay. right? Now, it's very clearly determined that raw cannabis, THCA, or acid, yes. the acidic component, or CBDA, is equal or more efficacious in an anti-inflammatory role than the heated or decarboxylated yes. cannabis. None of the pharmaceutical cannabis is presented in the raw form, that's the first thing. Right? They, don't, have they don't list any of the minor cannabinoids. They just list the CBD and THC. It's an atrocious yep. parody. And we haven't worked 30 years to have a bunch of greedy corporate scum degrade the cannabis medicine and then charge three times the black market price. Right? I mean, there has to be space for outrage in this world. Right? When you said the, the favourite thing, people suffer. Right? I've seen kids suffer, fit and die for want of a quality oil. Yeah, right? I think the and big problem is not care. the it's kids it's who it's need, you know, maybe 400, 500 milligrams of CBD a day, and then they're charging $150, $200 for a 1,000 milligrams, and it's like, so they've got that for two days, and then they have to spend another almost $200. Like, that's a big problem, when it's so bloody cheap to manufacture and produce. Yeah, but what um, I'm saying too is if you're having it in the unheated form, you might get away with $200. Okay, yeah. It, that's that's where the, the preliminary knowledge is going. Uh, there's so many different ways. It's simply not a place where the government should be. Right? The real problem is, and I mean, people have to understand this, the cannabis prohibition was brought in as a smokescreen to destroy the, the re-emergent hemp industry. Are you all familiar with this? I understand it as like, um, mainly to get cotton to prosper in the US. Oh, uh, no, mate, listen. You really have to go to YouTube and watch Billion Dollar Crop. Mm -hmm. right? What happened in the 1930s, hemp was the, up until about 1880, hemp was the most grown crop on earth, yeah. and hemp fiber was the most traded commodity on it. Right? It was used for naval ropes, riggings and sails, and found literally thousands of other applications. Right? Yep. Yeah. Australia was meant to be the next big great hemp colony. Where, well, um, John Jiggins has written a book on that, uh, Banks and the Question of Hemp in Australia, and, and that's, that's quite true. But with the decline of hemp because of the replacement of the wind power by the steam, hemp went into decline. But in the early 1930s, Mr. Schlichten perfected a hemp decorticator, which is a machine to strip the bark fibre from the inner herd. And he just, see, prior to that, it was done by slave labour manually. It's a bit like chain cutting, you have to go and get in there with a knife and crush these fibres. Once the machine came along, popular mechanics hailed it as the new billion dollar prop in 1937. Right, so in 1937 the Popular Mechanics magazine published a thing called the new billion dollar prop. And they were arguing that cannabis shouldn't be banned. Yeah. Right? During the banning, you know this history don't you? The, the mm -hmm. Marijuana Transfer Tax Act? Yeah. Because at that stage they had no legal capacity to ban cannabis because it was a widely used medicine and widely used industrial, right? So they introduced a transfer tax act, meaning to have any transaction in cannabis you had to pay a tax. 
but they didn't issue the tax certificate, so it just sort of strangled, strangled the industry. Right? And they did that. It's got nothing to do with cotton. Cotton didn't become a like chemical for the 50s, right? It was about the introduction of nylon, right? Nylon. I mean, Andrew Mellon, who was running um, the banker, the, the Mellon Bank, Andrew Mellon, financed the whole thing with, with DuPont and nylon, and he appointed Harry Ainslinger to be the goof head that started the Reef of Madness campaign. Right? You really have to watch Billion Dollar Crop. I thought it's the sort of, the, you have to understand where this prohibition came from. It grew out of the system's need to crush natural fibres. But if you had a cheap competition yeah. for building material for fabrics, all sorts of plastics, and I'll say it again, Henry Ford built a car from hemp plastic in 1941, and you'll see a, a, a copy of in the billion dollar crop, banging it with a sledgehammer, right? Hemp plastic, 1941, no rust, no panel beaters, you know, it goes on and on. It's pathetic what they've done to suppress technology. That's um that that's a great historical look at it, but there's there's other elements to this as well, which I think should probably be mentioned. And while um we we can definitely talk about the the, the massive hemp industry which existed during the age of sale and from 16th up to about the 18th 19th centuries, there's um there's also a very recent uh, or comparatively recent aspect to the whole. Um, the, the, the campaign against marijuana it was Richard Nixon in America in the 1970s and some of you might remember his uh, war on drugs and, and how it was the number uh, that was Reagan, Reagan not Nixon no, Nixon uh, started it but Ra Reagan Reagan was the one who pushed it yeah yeah, yeah. And and there's um there was a well there was a tape that was declassified from the Nixon administration which um they're one of the uh, one of the top Nixon aides, a guy called Ehrlichman, and um, in this interview he said, you want to know what this is all really about, referring to the war on drugs. The campaign in 1968 in the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. Here. Yeah, I know. We, we, we knew we couldn't make it illegal to be bl against the war or to be black, but by getting the public to associate hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities, we could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about drugs? Of course we did. And, and you, you know, there's, there's, there's been this massively racist and, and heavily um, authoritarian trend to it that's underlined the, the more recent campaigns. And you can see all kinds of quotes about this. Um, w which have been uh, declassified from the Nixon and the, and the Reagan administrations. Absolutely. And using the prohibition to fill private prisons, I mean, mm. it's pathetic the way it Absolutely, happens. absolutely. Yeah. And I can, I can speak from personal experience on this one as well, uh, because I, um, some of you may or may not know, I, I do a little bit of environmental activism, including with a group called Extinction Rebellion, have been in the news a little bit recently. And that, that we, we can absolutely confirm that, that the, the Queensland Police, and I'm sure I've, I've heard stories from other states as well, but a personal first and second hand account that the Queensland Police have targeted Extinction Rebellion activists on the basis of drugs usage. Listen, uh, mate, it goes back to the 60s special squad. Mm. Right? I mean, they used to target I mean, black activists there. They, used to, had, they had teams of men surveilling them. You know, special mm. squad? Yeah, yeah it, it hasn't died, it just changed its name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And you know you can see the most incredible. Um, you, you can. Sorry, Yosip, I think you've uh, dropped out there. But you, you can see the um, the anti-war public service. Sorry, the anti um, anti-drug public service announcements on YouTube from the from the 60s and the 70s, and they just sound absolutely ridiculous. All the reefer madness videos, and um, I'm, I'm sure you, you you guys are very familiar with Hunter S. Thompson's work. But for those of you who haven't seen uh, Fear and Loathing in Bos Las Vegas, one of his most famous and well-known novels in, in that they they go to a national district attorney's conference on drugs and and they show uh, a supposed quote-unquote expert and and his understanding of w what it's like to be on illicit substances and it's absolutely ridiculous absolutely laughable even for those of us who who may not have had much experience with psychoactive or mind-altering substances the the descriptions in uh, of, of this in, in fear and loathing was absolutely laughable, and and you realise that that they're actually being serious, and this is actually not a caricature of of um, 
have official justice policy towards illicit substance usage, no, they genuinely believe some of these things. That you also, were you trying to say something? Uh, um, nothing major. My main thing was um, with regarding like being targeted by police and all of that. Um, I was just saying that's why I went and actually saw a doctor and got the medical cannabis because now it is possible. So I've got like I quite a bit of immunity from being targeted for such things. Um, that was honestly it. It might have cost me a bit, a bit of a penny, but it's pretty much a get out of jail free card. So it's just something to think about in regards to the way Australia is going. Um, You're aware, is anyone aware that the US government has a patent, put a patent on CBD in 1985 as a neuroprotectant anti-inflammatory? Yeah. At the same time, that. the DEA held that cannabis was a dangerous addictive drug with no medical properties. Yep. Unbelievable. Listen, we're, we're, we're under the control of a system that's best described as evil, that's psychopathic, where they will sacrifice the young and the elderly sick for their profits. I mean, we've yeah. got to look at the situation we've allowed ourselves to be forced into, right? A bunch of criminals are basically saying you can't have a natural and effective medicine. I mean, there has to be a sense of growing outrage at this. Mm. Once people seeing, I mean, when we, we talk about the Jesus weed, because we see miracles. Yeah. Right? I mean, people with some neurodegeneration, and all sorts of things, you can get a turnaround in a week, you know, so they can suddenly hold a cup of tea themselves without assistance and walk, right? I mean, we have seen, repeatedly, we've seen miracles now mm -hmm. due to this natural plan in its natural form. And, you know, what do I consider, Miles? I mean, this pharmaceuticalization of medical cannabis, I find profoundly offensive, mm -hmm. right? They have no moral justification for taking control of a plant-based medicine that they opposed for, for 80 years. Yeah, it's, it's frustrating. It, it should be going towards like your naturopaths and holistic approach sorts of doctors or clinics, you know, it should well, be its own okay, segment okay, to me. Yeah, listen. The, the way I see it, right, I mean, as we want three levels of supply, we want home growing, compassionate growing, and pharmaceutical production, as we want those three, we also want different levels of intervention, right? You don't need to go to a doctor if you have insomnia and you want to have a little chuff at night to help you sort yeah. of have sweet dreams. I'm thinking you go to a doctor for the referral to go to a clinic, right? No, no, but, we have but to not do, a no, doctor's no, clinic. No, 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 I'm not no. thinking of a doctor's clinic. I'm no, thinking more like a dispensary site. Listen, sorry to say it, but stuff them, right? Because they've spent so long peddling the bullshit and now they want to run the show, right? I mean, wake up, right? These turkeys have been leading people down the garden path for too long. You look at the health outcomes we're currently suffering, the rates of diabetes, autoimmunity, asthma, cancer, Alzheimer's disease are catastrophic. And these creeps are still claiming the high moral ground. Right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I am thoroughly and completely sick of the situation I find myself in, where our innovations, our sort of concepts of, of you know, fully sustainable villages built around um, homegrown houses and, you know, homegrown food, hemp seed, you know, without getting onto the health issues of omega-3 and all, all the rest of it. It's a big topic. Um, yeah, we've got to get into it. As I said before, people are asleep at the wheel and the car is running towards the cliff. How do you think people will wake up to that, though? I think that is fundamental. Well, there's two ways, mate. If, if you're heading, if you're heading towards a, a cliff, you can wake up a, because you've got a frontal cortex and you can analyse the situation, mm. right? See, or you can go over the cliff and hit the bump, and then you can wake up at the end. See, right? To me, know, like we had a little people. discussion about COVID prior to starting this stream, and I yeah. don't want to get into that at all. Um, but I would say. COVID to me has been an interesting thing for people mentally to see what's going on. Um, everyone's been able to take a little bit of a step back, whether they got you know displaced from work, had to work from home. But suddenly to me, it seemed like people suddenly got their time back. And I, I've seen more of a conscious shift of people starting to explore new ideas and start questioning what they're being told by everything during this COVID period. So to me, I, I, I think this has actually started that transformational shift. I think it's why cannabis, like, it's not entirely why at all, 
but it's, it's starting to get that conversation going about hmm, maybe we haven't been living how we're supposed to be living. We've been put into, you know, shoebox apartments and things in the city. We've been congested to be, you know, trying to colonize cities and just pushing more and more people in. And from what I see, this is where I get very upset with what's going on in Australia in particular. They're just trying to destroy rural communities. To me, the government is trying to get rid of everyone in rural communities to ultimately control. No, no, the, it's deeper uh, than that. It's trying to destroy communities, mm -hmm. right? Not only rural community. Right, yep. they're fragmenting humanity. Right, I mean, where's the sense of outrage that we're forced into practices like face nappies, which are known to be ineffective and potentially dangerous? Right, they're enforcing those things. What about the enforcing of flu immunisation to visit people in old people's homes? It's ridiculous. People who've had flu immunisations are more likely to develop a COVID infection. Right. So, I mean, if vaccinations, away from hang on, let me say this: if vaccinations. Wait, wait. If vaccinations are so damn good, right, why haven't we got rid of influenza? It's every bit the problem it's been for the last 20 years, despite but the increase in vaccinations. We, we've talked a lot about the, the health benefits and various aspects of health surrounding cannabis and different applications. But um, the, like we, we sort of briefly looked at earlier in the stream, there's this huge area of, um, of different applications of, of cannabis legalization in, which will impact our economy and our society and one of the um, one of the really interesting ones which I wasn't even aware of until I started engaging with with the uh, hemp party a few years ago was the the idea of this thing called hemp creep and um, yeah. Yeah, Yossip would you, do you are you familiar with that at all no I've, I've, I've got the one talk about hemp uh, I know hemp creep but I would I would go with Andrew he builds with it <laughs> Oh, please, Andrew, take it away. It's, what? It's magic stuff, right? There's lots of different ways to do it. Um, hempcrete is just like really a cellulose cement product, and there's dozens of different ways to do it. We've experimented with all sorts of things. My favourite mix at the moment is magnesium oxide, which is mined locally at Orange, <coughs> and mm. uh, ground blast furnace slag, which comes out of the steel mills, a, a recycled product. It, it's a magnificent building. That's material, amazing. Right? And as I said before, the carbon sequestration right the numbers are these if you build your average and these are rubbery numbers but they're, they're more or less solid if mm -hmm. you build a average brick dwelling it's something like 500 tons of carbon dioxide are incorporated in that and the process if you build the same size structure from hempcrete right you have a net banking of 50 right so instead of putting out 500 you take out 50 so you're saving 450 tonnes for every dwelling. Now that's using old style hempcrete. We're mm. developing newer and newer forms of not only hempcrete itself, but how to apply the hempcrete. So at this stage, most of the hempcrete construction put up a timber frame and then infill with hempcrete. Have you seen the hose stuff? Timber. What's that? Have you seen the hempcrete that comes out of hoses? The shot crane? That shit is amazing. Hey? You can like you only end up needing like two workers to man it. That's what's yeah. crazy. But it um, depends. I mean, there's there's so, I mean, it's a very flexible building style. You know, you can do pour in inform work. You can do shot creating. You can do blocks in England. Stop it, mate. Stop. No, 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 no. no just put it down. Sorry, sorry, kids. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. It's, it's Take a minute if you need to. <laughs> Was attacking by glue gun, bro. Oh no! <laughs> Where was I up to on that one? Um, ways to use hempcrete. Lots of ways in the UK. Oh yeah, in the UK they're doing it at the industrial level. They're making, you know, tilt slab construction. So they have 4.8 meter lengths of hempcrete. The advantage there, see, in England they have a very narrow time when you can actually build with hempcrete because you you have to do it, but then it has got a cure. In Australia, because of our temperatures and things, it cures really easily. But in England, they only really have the summer period to do the hempcrete building. They got around that by building hempcrete panels. That's cool. Right? And cures them in the, in the factory, and then you can bring them out, right? We've done a construction where we had, so you can alter the ratio of hemp fibre, the herd it's called, to the binder. So you've got the powder binder, the cement sort of thing, and the, the, yeah, the, the cellulose gravel, and you combine them in different ratios. Right? Mm -hmm. So the more binder you put in, the more dense is the product, but the less its um, breathability and things like that. So we started with a dense hempcrete as the base, the floor, 
an intermediate hempcrete for the walls and a lighter hempcrete for the roof. And we actually encased the roofing timbers in the hempcrete. So it becomes completely fireproof and completely termite proof. Right? Wow. Yet, if you want to redesign it, you can just cut it open, grind it, and put it back in the mix and reuse it. Or you can spread it on your garden as a soil conditioner. Mm. You know, there are no downsides. Also, the herd, which is the short fibre from the inner part of the stem, that's a byproduct of the production of the bast fibre, which would be an immensely profitable, much more profitable than coffee. Because from the one crop, you can have a co-harvest, co long fibre, the bast, short fibre, the herd, and the seed, which is the real gold of the hemp, right? I mean, the contribution to hemp seed now in this world, it might be our lifeline. What people don't know, in the early 1800s, hemp seed saved the colony from starvation, from what I've informed. Because the hardy plant can grow with little rainfall. Here in Australia? Seed, hey? Here in Australia? Yeah. Yeah, see, it, I, mean, I think Joseph made the point that we were going to be a colony at some stage. That was the plan. That's why we didn't um, colonise um, India. They found that the hemp variety there wasn't the type they wanted to yeah. grow. Yeah, listen, John Mark. Chicken has written a book on it. We won't get into it because uh -huh. I mean, I'm not up on the technicals. But they sent the wrong one, basically. Actually, I might write that down. I might yeah. read the book. But yeah, hemp, hemp creed is a, is a cracker of the product. I know. Like, you can, you can do anything. For instance, for instance, you can stretch some wire, right? Oh, say you want a, like a bush enclosure or you want to do something artistic and then just apply the hemp cream and build it up by hand in layers. So you can make and give it, it almost like paper mache, uh, paper mache. Anything, make plasticine, paper mache, you know, it's just, if you can imagine it, you can build it from hemp cream. What um, I found out with hemp cream that really blew my mind was about three acres of uh, hemp grown, no metric, three to four. Hey, <laughs> okay. If we're going metric, what's ten, that? That would be. Um, you get about ten dr uh, dry stem, like tons of dry stem material per hectare. As a rule, you can get a lot more, but that's a, a that's a practical thing, right? Um, but it would build like a four bedroom house. In oh, easily three to four months. Oh, um, yeah. And. So roughly one and a half uh, hectares, maybe even a bit less, 1.2, yeah, yeah. would roughly create a four bedroom house in about three or four months, like raw material wise. And then what I found out that was really cool was the Japanese were using hemp creek for hundreds of years. So they have houses um, that were built about three, four hundred years ago out of hemp creek that are still standing today. And, and the actual hemp creek turned into stone. It's gotten harder and harder. And these buildings have actually gotten stronger with time. And I think that was something that was fascinating with hemp creek for me. The French, I thought that was, that, that applied in France. I mean, no, we learned it. from the Japanese. Yeah. Um, the Japanese, people don't know, but the Japanese emperor, one day of the year, their very holy Shinto day, he can only dress in hemp fabric. Mm. Right? So the emperor has to dress entirely in hemp fabric. The Buddha, I think it was, when he was doing his privations, he lived on one hemp seed a day. Oh, wow. Yeah. Good luck, you might need a few more. <laughs> that, that's a, this very famous Buddhist proverbs about how, um, how, how one of the trials of the Buddha was he went to, when he was very young, Shakyamuni went to live with the ascetics and he lived off a, a I think it was a single grain of rice. That was one version of the story went for an entire year. Uh, but I, I hadn't heard that it may have actually been a hemp seed that he lived yeah, off. It depends. It tells um, the well, I wish the hemp seed would give him a little bit of fat and a little more uh, protein. Oh, it'd be much, much, look, <laughs> much better let, than the grain of rice. <laughs> hang on, let, let's talk about hemp seed. Just, just give me 90 seconds on hemp seed. Right? Go for I it. I consider the hemp seed the single most balanced and nutritious food source available to humanity. Mm. Right? Now, just going through it, it's got more omega-3 than most seafood, right? It's got more B group vitamins than wheat germ, right? It's got more minerals than almost any other foods. Like right? it's got more vitamin E. Than What's anything. your favorite way to eat hemp seeds, Andrew? Well, because we want people to consume them in reasonable quantities, and I consider a minimum 40, 50 grams a day for an adult, you know, and growing kids can have that much. Smoothies, but like there's hundreds yeah. of ways to do it. We're experimenting, but making a berry smoothie, like right? something or fruit smoothie for the kids. Get, mm -hmm. Instead of fucking dairy foods, right, with all the problem with allergy and the, the ecological disaster as well, right, get something like a Nutribullet, and I don't want to do an ad for Nutribullet, but I've used a lot of blenders, and Nutribullet is the one. They do well, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, they just do it well, right? You put your dose of hemp seed, get some coconut water, get some frozen berries or fresh berries or fruit. You know, those old bananas, put them in the freezer, make a berry, a bit of um, yep. honey, a bit of maple syrup. I'm oh, really into hemp seeds over like a salad. Hey? I really like just sprinkling hemp seeds over salads. Yeah, so, I know. Like, but that, that's, that's sort of like, look, don't give me the fucking sprinkling over salads. That shit's <laughs> not enough. Because it's, yeah. a, it's tokenist and bullshit, right? You know what else I've no, done no, with hemp seeds? Listen to me. No. This is, this is not something you've, you've ever done. done. But, mate, you've got me. <laughs> Have you ever put hemp seeds in meatballs? No, uh, well, you can do that if you want. Let me come back. Right? Therapeutically, I mean, people might be familiar with the, the old Goodwick protocol using quark and flaxseed oil. Mm -hmm. She had a fairly amount of success. We have a modified version, we brought it up to date, where we blend again in the Nutribullet hemp seed, lemon juice, and garlic, and you serve that over either steamed or baked vegetables or salads. Mm -hmm. right? And that's done therapeutically. Right? Mm -hmm. Hemp seed, lemon juice, and garlic. Right, as a dressing over over vegetables is a very useful way to get the hemp seed. But you know, a token of putting a teaspoon over the salad just gives me oh, the shits. It's a tablespoon. Because, Come on. Yeah, but even so, it, it it gives me the shits because then you'll say I eat the hemp seeds and I'm still you know this this and this and it hasn't had that sort of effect. Right? Also, also when you're dealing with omega three and omega, um, it can be out competed if you have too many aberrant fats. So if you're loading up on trans fats of bloody omega six. It can be out competitive in fish. So to get the benefit of the hemp seed, you've got to also cut down on the rubbish. Now, this is what I wanted to say. Fukushima, or Fukushima, as the Australians say, Fukushima is the world's biggest disaster in progress. And it's been subject to a complete cone of silence. We've got to face the facts that not that far north of us, there is a triple meltdown in progress. And it has been for years. Triple meltdown. That means the nuclear reaction, the fission reaction, has gone through the containment vessel, the stainless steel, it's gone through the concrete, and it's now in the ground. You know what they're doing in Japan? They're spraying seawater, 300 tonnes of seawater a day, on the reactor to keep it from going critical, and the shit is just washing out. They're initially putting it in tanks, all the tanks are full and leaking, so they're now just running it out to sea. They detected cesium on the west coast of America years ago. Like within 18 months of the um, tsunami, they detected the cesium. You know what the American buddy government's response was? Double the safety limit and stop testing. Oh. Right? We're fucked, right? I mean, the, the world, no, seriously, the billion people that depend on omega-3 from seafood are going to be very short of omega-3 very soon, right? That's where hemp seed is going to come in. It's going to be the saviour of humanity because we can actually grow plant-based omega-3, right? And have the shortfall for the loss of the oceans, which we're very soon going to experience, right? Just to, to put you in the picture, building four, and do your own research on this. This isn't my story. This is what's happening. Building four was meant to store one year of fuel rods. It turned out the Japanese government had 10 years of fuel rods in there. Yeah. Can you put your voice down? Right? Where was I up to? <laughs> Ten years of fuel rods in yeah, Reactor yeah. 4. Anyway, building 4, can you remember the issue where they had that hydrogen explosion? You, you remember that? I think about day 2 or something like that, there was a big yeah, yes. thing, right? It blew one of the legs off building 4, so it's now teetering on three legs. With It used to have 1,200 fuel rods in the swimming pool, right? They've managed to extract four of them so far. Because when they bring the robots in, the gamma radiation is so intense, the circuits fry. Right? They don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. But it's the thing you don't do is do nothing or say nothing, right? We mm -hmm. should be convening an urgent meeting of all nuclear capable scientists to actually thrash out some sort of approach to this, right? It mm -hmm. is the worst. People go on and on about Chernobyl. Chernobyl was nothing. It was a one-off chemical explosion that spread a lot of nuclear material over an area. This is a meltdown. This is an ongoing fission reaction bubbling away in the soil. There's three of them, right? It's a disaster. Mm. Who's reporting it? You know, who's measuring the fish? You know, it's, it's, um... it's a disaster. Anyway, coming back to more positive, at least we'll have some omega-3 if we grow enough hemp seed. Yeah, right? But it, I can't... It... I can't overstate it. It is an excellent therapeutic food. 
right? Everyone's familiar with the importance now of ketosis, nutritional ketosis, right? The hemp seed allows us to craft diets that are highly nutritious yet ketogenic, right? And we, we depend on the hemp seed really for some of our cancer uh, opposing diets because it allows us in a calorie restricted way and a carbohydrate restricted way to deliver intense nutrition, right? And if you love your kids out there in internet land, go get some hemp seed, get yourself a little Nutribullet and get smoothies happening, adjust it until the, the child likes it. Yeah, and that's my take home message. I um, it's it's great that you mentioned robots because that that was actually a big interest of mine. But um, just just while one last thing while we're on subject of seeds, I've got a friend who also loves smoothies, and she swears by flax and chia seeds. She makes smoothies all the time, almost practically lives off them, fills them up with flax and chia seeds. How do they compare to hemp seeds in terms okay. of that, your? That's very interesting. And, and what you've mentioned, like hemp seed, there's two essential fatty acids, right? There's omega three and omega six. And for health, they should be in a ratio of one part of three to less than three parts of six, right? From one to three to one to two, but that's a sort of the ballpark. In the SAD diet, the standard American diet, people have been measured, <laughs> no, serious, people have been measured to have 10 to one. So they have 10 times omega six compared to omega three, right? And that sets up the chronic inflammation that results in cancer and diabetes and heart disease and all the other things, right? Now, the two things that you mentioned, flax and chia, are the only sources of omega-3 which are higher than hemp, right? So chia has a, an inverted rate. They have two times the amount of omega-3 compared to omega-6, and flax is more or less the same, whereas hemp has a one to three. So the issue, though, that I find and what we do in our diets, firstly, it's good to, to have that if that's all you've got, but the way we approach it we give the hemp seed as the background, which is going to be for long-term use, and we supplement it in the short term with flax or chia. So you might add, say, 40 grams of hemp seed, you might add 10 grams of chia to augment the omega-3, because if you just take maintenance levels from the hemp seed, you don't correct the deficiency, right? But the critical mm. reason why I wouldn't only do flax or chia, rather than combine them with a hemp seed, is plant-based omega-3 is called alpha-linolenic acid, right? It's 18, sorry, I'll just get this computer screen. It's 18 carbons long. That's called, that's the original essential fatty acid, right? When the humans, say the fish eat the, the little plankton and, and things like that and get the alpha, the 18 carbon long, they elongate it to what you call DHA and EPA. You might have seen those on labels. Have you seen that? Uh, that that's, that's what they call the elongated omega-3, the animal form, the form that are in fish, right? Now, okay. the should have both forms, but if you just give omega-3 plant-based alpha linolenic, say flaxseed, the, the cofactors, the cofactors for the elongation or the metabolism of the omega-3 aren't there. You need lots of B-group vitamins, you need manganese, you need magnesium, you need zinc. They're all present in the hemp seed. That's why we use hemp seed as the basic nutritional unit, but we supplement it with flax and chia. Mm. Does that answer that question? I'll be honest, a lot of that was a little bit over my head, but uh, if I understand the gist of it, you're suggesting that um, that that hemp, hemp is good, but you need to balance your intake and, and what we get in flax and chia seeds, you can you can get a more balanced intake of... No, 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 that's, I might have given a wrong impression. I'll just, sorry, I'm just relocating this, I'm a bit quieter. Mm. No, no, what I was saying is, the hemp provides perfect nutrition for a well-nourished person to maintain that nourishment. But most of the patients, in fact, I'll say all the patients we get, have a disturbed omega-3 to 6 ratio, right? So they have much more six than three. Have you got that? Uh, yes. You've got one yep. part of three, say three parts of six. That's what you should have. That's what MC delivers. But if you're already started with ten parts here, if you only give one to three, it takes a long time to correct it. So we supplement with additional omega three whilst providing the essential cofactors to metabolize it. Yeah, we, we can cover that maybe in writing. I can put something in writing that might be easy to digest. It, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. 
Well, um, that that was great, and even though it was a little bit technical for me, I'm sure there's a lot of people who's gonna who are gonna get a lot out of that. And um, yeah. our viewers actually have spikes just while you were talking. We've we've got several new viewers just over the last few minutes. Um, so so that's great. Let's well, our um, motivation here, Miles, because I know if you mm. nourish your kids, you're gonna get brighter kids, right? I mean, we're in mm. a dumbing mm. down spiral, and I'm gonna get my tuppence worth in on fluoride, right? I consider next to legalizing cannabis, abolishing fluoride is the most essential thing we have to do. Just move, moving away from health, let's um, let's let's move. We, we've covered health pretty conclusively. We've also covered um, use of hemp as a superfood, which is really interesting, and it actually never occurred to me before. Let's um, uh, so a little while before Andrew, you mentioned uh, you you mentioned um, how in in the Fukushima reactors they were using robots to to extract some of the um, super critical fuel rods. And and that kind of reminded me that um, where one of the other right. crises we're we're, right. we're facing as a society at the moment is and myself as a transhumanist I don't like to look on this as a crisis but I'm talking about the um, the steady rise of automation now uh, I consider myself an engineer and I uh, pro predominantly software so uh, I'm not so much into the hardware per se but it still fascinates me as a topic and I can I'm I'm young enough to remember a time where we did have uh, people in, in, in supermarkets who, who would scan your groceries and put them through, but now it's all automated, you just go and you scan it yourself. And, and I remember a time when, when tr your transport companies, your couriers in Australia Post, they'd come out and they'd hand deliver it and they'd put it in your letterbox, but now if you, if you look at, um, listen to some of the stories coming out of uh, Amazon and Alibaba, the massive logistics corporations in China and America, that they're they, while they still have a massive uh, human labor force, they're looking at bringing in increasing amounts yeah. of mechanization. I mean, transitions of technology has been in place since the 1700s. I mean, there was a group of the Luddites in America, where they thought the, um, the cotton weaving thing was going to ruin all their, their home industries, so they rioted, but they were suppressed, right? Mm. I mean, it's not so much the automation. For instance, just to take it back to my personal experience, I mean, years ago when we were doing the original hemp agriculture, you know, we'd go and harvest this hemp seed by hand, right? And then as we sort of moved up, we got the headers. It turned out a header could replace two men working a whole day in 10 or 15 minutes, right? I don't see the value in hard, repetitious physical work unless you want to do it. Right? Using sensible machinery and automation is fine, but it's the overall, the issue is the automation is being used as a source of power by dispossessing the labourers. That's the problem. Yeah. If automation yeah. is used to serve humanity, it's a good thing. If it's used to consolidate the power of greedy mongrels, it's a good thing. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. And and so what we're seeing at the moment is that um, there's this steady rollout of automation and it's 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 been hitting up more and more areas. And as a result, we're seeing, like you say, dispossession. We're seeing job displacement and job loss. And and, and companies are saying, Coles and Woolworths are saying, oh no, well, we're retrenching those people who used to be scanned at the checkout. We're putting them in different areas. We're putting them in night fill. We're putting them in, um, you know, cleaning and and, and, and shelf stocking. But uh, sooner or later, we're going to start seeing robots in those positions as well. And and so the question now, which we need to be asking ourselves, is. This, this is a trend which shows no sign of stopping. So what happens when it gets to the point where there aren't any more jobs? Yeah. So uh, if I can quickly jump in here, Yossip, you and I discussed this briefly last year during the election. Uh, do you want to sort of refresh us on what your position of an automation was back then? Um, fuck, it's going to be a <laughs> I put you on the spot. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's a thing that's inevitable, firstly. Um, I think, ultimately, the only solution that I see, other than, you know, a lot of people dying and, like, you know, cities collapsing and society collapsing, is a universal basic income. I think it really comes down to providing people to still be able to have their means, um, like, you know, rent, food, whatever they need, and then, still then people would have the ability to perhaps work on what they choose to work on you know rather than having to be a slave to making this business you know sell 
you know, things at a checkout. They can spend that time producing artwork. They can spend that time innovating something, really focusing in on what they deem important to themselves. And uh, often I hear the argument, you know, they're going to go into, uh, they're just going to smoke marijuana and play video games. And I'm like, they might. I think there will be a section of the population that does do that, but that's probably because they're avoiding something else internally. But I think eventually people will get bored and they'll want to start doing things. And I think an economy will be built out of, uh, that. it could be built out of people creating whatever they feel like creating because they'll find people that have value. Well, in hang that. on, listen, you can't talk about sort of adjusting the way people interact with the economic system without talking about the economic system itself, right? Mm -hmm. We have a criminal enterprise based on fiat currency, right, and based on credit control, right? These organizations call banks can take a million dollars and on the basis of having a million, they can lend 10 million at interest, right? The whole thing is open mirror scandal, right? We're basically prisoners of the economic system. We're like rats running on a cage just to stay afloat, right? Mm -hmm. The wealth of the world, if we demilitarized, the wealth of the world is people could work two, three or four days at their choice. Right, yeah, rather yeah. than become, we're, we're basically just techno slaves, serfs, but they don't realise it. Everyone thinks they're so wonderful and free and they go and have Chardonnay on Fridays or something like that. But yeah, they're yeah. really just rats mm. imprisoned by the financial system. Mm. Right? Mm. If the financial yep. system was working as a means of the distribution of value rather than the control of value, it'd be a different matter. Mm. Right? Um, I mean, in terms of where, where the world could go. I mean, the ecological crisis, in part, may force a decentralisation, right? I yeah, mean, I, yeah. so I had a little farm up in the uh, Hunter Valley of Dungog, right? And there were eight dairies up there, and in the old days before that, there was a butter and cheese factory, and each of the valleys had their distinct butter and cheese factory. But then they passed these laws that all the milk had to go to Sydney to be burnt in a furnace, and you couldn't get the fresh milk up there, then it came back in plastic containers. Right? If you want to have an orange juice now, you, you go and get to at your, your 7-Eleven or something like that. It's been grown by sweat labour in Brazil. They've concentrated it by an industrial process, shipped it over here in drums and added tap water and put it in a plastic container. You know, that's not a way that humans should interact with oranges. Mm. You know, we've mm. created a nonsense. Globalisation is just a way of tangling the web. So they control everything by making us interdependent on things that they ultimately control. Mm. I, I don't know if the viewers share my alarm, but you know, humanity is in a very dire predicament at this stage. Right? I think, I think we all, um, we're, we're all big, at least in the pirates, we're big supporters of decentralization and grassroots access to yeah. participate in various processes. Not to mention it was really important. food control, uh, community mm. markets, uh, all sorts of things. Local food control is a really interesting one that uh, you should bring up because this is something I'm also involved with personally here here in Brisbane, and and the term we use here is food sovereignty and sovereignty meaning yeah. um, control over over the self in, in a very fundamental uh, at a very fundamental level in a very fundamental sense that you get to dispose and disperse however in a certain sense. So in terms of food sovereignty, what we're doing here at the start of COVID at the start of the lockdown here in Brisbane, a bunch of activists decided well. Why don't we spend our time useful? And uh, you know, there's all those memes at the start of lockdown about how all the uh, millennials and Gen Zs were making bread in, in the middle of lockdown. You're learning how to make bread and baking bread in their ovens, and, that, and that's great. But th this group of activists here in Brisbane, we decided to go out and start community gardens, and not just any community garden. We did them in parks. So we went out to a park and then just dug it up and put in fertilizer and set up mulching and compost and weed yeah, tea yeah, and that's, we. That's quite we, a big movement around the world. Yeah, and yeah. so we, we, these these gorilla gardens sprung up and we didn't ask for permission. We just went and did it, and so now we're growing food on on public land. What's mm -hmm. quote unquote public? What's uh, officially it's owned by council or state government or commonwealth or whoever, but we're using it to grow food. And we've been through multiple harvests now. It's been about. Um, in the region of about six to eight months and uh, the, the, the garden that I'm involved with we've actually been supplying a community kitchen which then cooks it and, and puts on free meals for um, so you're, doing that as a you're doing that as a voluntary basis now but if things deteriorate much more it'll be the essential thing it's like in the depression the great depression mm. the soup mm. kitchen saved people's lives that may be the only source of food 
And these people, these immoral mongrels that are running the system, I mean, they're morally capable of restricting cannabis access to dying people. They're very morally capable of restricting food to people as a coercion. Yeah. That's why I like that term is food sovereignty, right? Because you can be controlled. I mean, most people choose to eat rather than anything else, you know, as an option. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, if you control your food supply, at least your basic food supply, that's very useful. Do you, Not to mention your uh, health. If you were to you know, try and cut off people's food supplies in that sense, you'd just have a massive revolt and... No, you wow. wouldn't, because, no, you wouldn't, mate, it'd be divide and conquer. The Australians at this stage so apathetic, overweight, pre-diabetic, asthmatic, and, and otherwise incapacitated, have a massive anything, right? Um, yeah, what can I say? I mean, it's right. coming down. I'm, I'm starting to feel there's only a small minority of people that can still think properly in this country. Right? I mean, you go and talk to what we call the general public and tell me what you think. Depends, I guess, on the circles that you're in, but yeah. Exactly, yeah, I mean, this is the problem. I mean, you move into those circles, then you get out of that circle somewhere else and you realise the rest of the world is nothing and you're in a different tribe. It's, it's frustrating because, for me, the biggest problem that I see personally that what social media has done it's caused that divide of left and right to be so different yet at one time no one really gave a shit to me that's what the caused stop. so much tension left and right what a crappy term right in the yeah. old days in the 60s the left meant significant social policies and meant social uplift mm. for the disadvantage it meant mm. sliding tax does it meant all this it means nothing now mm -hmm. right that's it yeah. means nothing, and I hate the people who use the word left because there is no left anymore. I wish mm. Exactly. Was... <laughs> that, this, this is what's yeah. so frustrating about the it. The left has been left out. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> the problem I see is, you know, I, 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 have, I have plenty of these guys on Facebook, the right. You know, they really hard align themselves to the right, and they talk about the left, and it's like cunts. There's no one even representing the left that you're talking about. Like, where are they? Yeah. <laughs> It's this complete nut of straw, man. And, and you see this all the time with various conservative commenters. They'll, they'll talk about, uh, and, and I get this utterly, utterly jarring thing going on where you'll even hear some Australian conservative commenters saying, oh, those goddamn liberal social justice warriors, and, and they're so-and-so, they'll go off. And, and obviously over here in Australia, the liberals are the conservatives. And yeah. so there's a hilarious irony that, um, that but, but even to radicals in Australia, smaller liberal is still a neoliberalism is still right-wing ideology the smaller liberal and the bigger liberal ultimately aligned and so so thus you can see like you were saying before Andrew the, the Australian Labour Party they call themselves a left-wing party they've got a fairly sizable faction that considers themselves social Democrat all the way through to Democrat socialist the, the ALP left but their policies federally are about uh, a slightly more funding for education and health yeah. Slightly, water, slightly water larger tax on business. Yeah. yeah, exactly. A watered down version of, of the LNP's policy. When you get right down to it, there's very little like, policy differentiation. It's just this silly scouting sense. match. Listen, mate, the battle was lost, from what I gather, and I'm not a great history student, but with Chifley, from what I gather, Chifley tried to nationalise the banks, but he was sort of squashed by the squatocracy. Mm. Right? And, you know, we've been suffering ever since. But like I said earlier, and you can't fix one small part of a problem without fixing the whole system, mm. right? Because it just can't work. We've got to change. I mean, do people know about social credit? Like, from what I gather, the American Revolution against the British mostly involved social credit. What the the colonists wanted to do was create their own, create their own social credit without borrowing it from a bank. Right? And then paying it back without interest. That's why they went to war. But a hundred years later, the American bankers joined forces with the English bankers and shafted the population. <laughs> but the idea was noble. Yeah. Right? And if we had social credit, I mean, say you wanted to build, say, a railroad which was massively increased productivity of your farms, you just say, okay, the government creates a credit as though they were a bank, and then it's paid back by the enterprise, but without interest. Mm -hmm. See, the problem is because of the interest, there's always a chronic shortage of money, right? Because it's say you borrow $10 million, but you've got to pay back 11 million, say the interest rate 10%, you've got to pay back 11. So there's this nonsense of chasing your tail, like we're serfs to the system. 
Um, Andrew, have you ever looked at decentralized finance? Uh, it's probably not my strongest um, sort of area, I have to say, and I usually yep. like to stay where I'm most comfortable. You're my, talking my, about um, micro loans and cryptocurrency there, right, Yosef? Yeah, that would be uh, it. This is this is a really interesting topic. Do you want to do you want to get into this a little bit? I mean, I'm not an expert. I'm happy to go into it, but I I so really you invest, right? I am a I am a crypto investor. I'm not like wealthy enough to quit my job or quit my life, but um, you know, I like to dabble. For me, the ideology of cryptocurrency is just you know just another form of casino, Johnson. Ah, uh, that's the, that's the, that's the problem. See, ethically, crypto makes sense, but the money that's involved with the people, because you'd funnel money from this fake economy into there, and then suddenly you're controlling that economy. You know, right? I see the flaw, but fundamentally, it makes sense. Yeah. Now, listen. We need to nationalise the banks and stop the fiat currency. Like, have real value in the currency. Remember in the 70s, like when I was sort of a young man, if you went overseas, one Australian dollar bought two US dollars. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, the country had a bit of wealth. We had manufacturing. Like Australia has an admirable show of manufacturing. Most people aren't aware. First digital computer was built by the CSIRO in the 1950s. Bloody Bob Menzies sent it to England. My um my dad came here from Croatia in the eighties and like he just talks about like you used to pay maybe thirty cents to two dollars a kilo for lamb. Yeah. And you know, now we're paying like thirty and it's like you can say inflation all you want, but it's definitely not two or three percent. Right? Yeah, well I say that look, I bought like a new Subaru in, in the nineteen eighties and it was like like eight seven thousand dollars eight thousand now it's forty five thousand. Yeah. Right? And the salaries haven't gone up by that. Not even a little. This is I think this is the really frustrating thing. I had this argument actually just yesterday on Facebook. Um, right wing fella, won't name him, but anyway, talking about how hard like Aussies do not want to work. You know, there's plenty of jobs going around in this COVID era and like they've lost three starter employees and they're not wanting to work. And I'm like, but what are the pay conditions? What are the working conditions? Maybe the person doesn't think it's worth slaving away doing hard labor for $22 an hour anymore. And your market hasn't adjusted to that. And this is what I'm kind of coming to the conclusion of with work as a whole. I think manual labor and physical labor and rep rep repetitive uh, kinds of jobs, they're worth so much more than they are paid. And I think the system needs to catch up to that. I, you know, people call these low skilled jobs, but the reality is they're not low skilled, they're just, I don't want to do it. And to me, that's something that I think is going to be shifting in the next, you know, 10, 15 years. I think there could be quite a lot of money to come out of these kinds of jobs that can't be automated. There's just a little too much with that. I don't know if anyone else has thoughts on that. <laughs> oh, absolutely! It, it's a massive topic, and um, I just, uh, just, just when on the subject of inflation and a floating currency, I want to get in another quick jab against the Labor Party. And Yossip's well aware, but for everyone else who's tuning in didn't catch my stream last time. During the recent Queensland state election, I ran a personal war against the Queensland Labor Party. Yeah, I was a, a fifth columnist for 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 yeah, Yossip, for the Australian Progressives, for the Greens, for um, for anyone with a good cause who wasn't conservative such as the Labour Party and uh, I'm just, just, just pointing out a little brief bit of history here. There's a guy called, I don't know if anyone's heard of a guy called Paul Keating or, or his good mate Bob Hawke, but um, in the late, eight, late, late 80s and early 90s they um, they were, oh they were, they were big, they were very big in the Labour Party as I understand it. They um, sold off the banks, eliminated tariffs, floated yeah. the Australian dollar and um, introduced ca um, a couple of gains tax, fringe benefits, dividend imputation, and, and basically started the neoliberal trend of privatisation that, that has been continued by Listen, the Liberal National Party and Labor to this day. We, we have to pretend we don't have even a, duo like a duopoly anymore. Mm, like yes. The system runs mm. in that direction, no matter who, which clown has got the microphone. <laughs> basically. <laughs> I just want to be the clown with the microphone next uh, year. <laughs> no, like, do you know how I... Like, you know how we've had so many PMs in the last 10 years? Like, we just change yep. up change. Yep. You know what it is? It's like, oh, let's put one of the boys in. He's going in. He's got it. He's got his 11 months or however long they need for that forever retirement. 
Fuck yeah, got it. Okay, who's next? Dead. They've got them dead. The shit starts to stick on them and they've got to get rid of them, right? Move yeah. to the next one. The target. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just forget about it because it's, it's a lot easier that way. And I don't know, I really do wonder how do we fundamentally change government? Like, how do we actually get real people involved rather than, I don't know, these empty vessels of human beings that actually stand for nothing than, other than corporate greed? Like, how do you do it? This is well, a how, hang on. How, did, how, did Mr. how did Mr. Castro do it? Oh, the guns, wait, wait a minute. You, you've got to get things right. The Bay of Pigs, right? The Bay of Pigs was a military invasion by the CIA, right? Without guns, they would have succeeded. With, with the Cubans not having guns, they would have succeeded, right? And they'd be prisoners. What they did, they occupied, and you can do it without firearms, you just need enough people, occupy things like the TV stations and the parliament and start broadcasting your reality. I mean, we do need an uprising, and I don't like the word revolution, because when you look at it, a revolution is 360 degrees, you end up where you started. What we need is an about face. Almost everything we're doing, we need to do opposite, right? Instead of cutting down trees, we need to plant the trees. Instead of digging holes, we need to fill them in. You know, we don't need the animal farm nightmare of the oppressed becoming the oppressors. We need to change the way we relate to the world in the first instance, right? But you can't change people's minds, dialectic and dialectic materialism, right? You've got to change their reality, right? And we've got to start a bit at a time. See, the beauty of the hemp policies, everyone says, how are you going to fund it? Where are you going to get the money? We can tell them straight up, you fuckwits, the billions of dollars you've been wasting <laughs> on jails and courts and police. Right. We got yeah. the money straight away. We can build a, help, a hemp textile mill. And if you, while you're building the mill, the farmers will be very keen to plant the crop because they know there's going to be a market for it. So mm. we've got a practical way to jumpstart the engine. And we've got the funding for it. I mean, those mongrel cops and the courts and all in the private jails might be the losers. Let them lose. Well, we've heard, we've heard a couple of solutions there. So just going back to... Um yeah, I think Joss, I think it was your question, how do we how do we get these 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 disconnected power hungry maniacs out of um, out of government? How, how do we actually get people back into politics, real people? Uh, so we've heard a couple of solutions. There's the Fidel Castro solution. And then there's um then there's there's the hempcrete solution. So uh, or, or rather overgrow just, the government is what we used to say. <laughs> overgrow that, the government. That's a really that's a great term, that's really catchy. Yeah, and and you know there's so many follow on benefits from that. I'm I'm gonna have to make a move, unfortunately. Mm. I've enjoyed we're, the conversation, and hopefully there'll be more in the future. Yep, we're we're we're, we're right on time, and um, we're we're definitely looking at wrapping up. If I can just quickly get in some uh, a quick plug, though, the um the the solution which I want to offer as well as an alternative, and so so we've talked about obviously legalizing cannabis to shut down the prison industrial complex and save huge amounts of money and massive economic growth. We've talked about that a lot. And, and I also talked a little bit about um, food sovereignty and taking control of your access to food and, and so being able to produce locally and decentralizing that way. But there's another way as well and, and it, we can take multiple different solutions and work on them side by side and, and make little gains in all of them and that might actually turn into actual substantial change and that's introducing more direct democracy into our processes. Yeah. And I've, I've been really, really captivated by parties like Flux Party and Online Direct Democracy who and Flux is really interesting because they're actually proposing about using uh, the blockchain as a method of of directly voting on all issues. And their platform was, if you elect one of our senators, then they'll be compelled to vote in a way that um, that that is the result of these of these uh, com uh, these votes on these issues. How, however, Australian citizens want to vote. And so, in, in the Pirate Party, we also do something very similar. We employ what we effectively call liquid democracy, where all of our policies are member voted and member proposed and everything is run in a decentralized fashion and so yeah. if we can take that principle and adopt it in a more widespread fashion if we can take power away from these state bureaucracies and these local yeah. government bureaucracies you know, listen, my, my first sort of dip into, into into political activism i suppose was the shed a tear party and what the Shed a Tear Party wanted to do was completely change the political landscape of the country, right? Basically, we've had these states which are really historical anachronisms and they have no significant geographical coherence about them, right?
right? Look at something like the Murray Darling. It's got three different states and everyone's stuffing it up, right? Mm. What we say, I can sort of, this is just Dreamsville, but you divide the country into something like 30 regions and each region has a coherence, like far north Queensland, you know, north New South Wales. Be called the uh, north Queensland independence at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Like the no, Queensland no, 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 but just stay, stay with the thought, right? So you're there, mm. and you elect representatives based on the population, so a pro rata. If you've got, say, inner Sydney, you might mm. get five representatives. You've got sort of the Dubbo area as one. It's just on a pro rata basis. So you'll have a parliamentary congress of a couple of hundred people, right? But mm. they, each of their areas, they, can, they have, instead of a state and council, you have the regional area, and then they become the federation. Okay. Do you see what I'm saying? I mean, what we've yeah, got now yeah, is a ridiculous... Seven departments of health, seven departments of, agri of uh, education. You know, it's just nonsense. So we'd have a federal system, but built around geographic entities that need a coordination and have common needs. Right? And move towards consensus, for God's sake. The problem is we've got conflict built into our political system by just having a two-party clown show. We need to have consensus, a bit like what you said, Miles. Of the hundreds, they might have, let's have a, a idea session. So you put up your ideas. Why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? Rather than make it a policy and then fight over it and score points against each other. Yeah. Right? We've got to move towards... Uh, ideas. Basically, what you're saying, Andrew, Parliament should be a few joints going around and talking about ideas. The peace pipe wouldn't hurt, mate. I mean, jokes aside, my, I mean, in my personal life, I mean, I'm now sort of living on acres and sort of building, you know, developing a, um, a diet-based sort of health retreat. So I do a lot of sort of work. Sometimes you get stumped. And I mean, I'll say this without fear of contradiction. You're not sure what to do. It might be something simple as fix your lawnmower or what you're going to plant in what location. Have a little puff and it becomes much more obvious. To you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so many times you need a motivation to go and do it. It's like, <laughs> I might have to do this tomorrow now, though. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's good, Miles. And, and you also no, have enjoyed the talk. I better thank make you. Um, thank, thank you so much, guys, for coming on. So this was uh, Dr. Andrew Cadillaris of the Help and Marijuana Prohibition Party and Josip Stidham of the Legalised Cannabis Queensland Party in conversation on the future of jobs. I'll see you guys around. I'm sure we're going to be looking, Josip, looking towards your exploits in the future and Andrew really keen to see some real substantive change in the Australian political environment. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks for organising, mate. Good on you. Miles. See you, everyone. I'll see Bye. you guys around. Bye. Bye.